So with this stark landscape behind me, we're gonna start talking about uh, D'Alembert's principle in more detail, and maybe even getting to the point where we're gonna call it Lagrange's equations. So let, let's, uh, let's dive in, okay, shall we? Shall we? All right, so I'm just gonna repeat a, um, an equation that we left off with last time. It's the sum, sum from one, i goes from one to n, this is the number of generalized coordinates. And then we summed over j goes from one to capital N, the number of particles, uh, the applied or active force, we might just start saying applied force, uh, minus m times the acceleration, or we'll write the inertial derivative of particle j's velocity. And that was dotted with these projection vectors, which I'm calling gamma, um, all times delta qi equals zero. This is just one equation because we're doing this double sum. Remember what these delta Qs were? These are admissible virtual displacements, meaning virtual displacements that also maintain the constraints. Admissible virtual displacements. So constraints are important. They're what um, kind of, oh, I keep running. The more constraints you have, the uh, kind of the more savings you get in terms of using D'Alembert's principle and Lagrange's equations. These gamma, gamma j i thingies, um, these projection vectors, they look like it's either partial r j, partial q i. That's one way to do it. Sometimes it's not obvious what that's going to give you. And so you could equally as well take the partial vj partial qi dot, and you get the same thing. So we mentioned last time there's two cases to consider. One is where your number of generalized coordinates n is equal to the number of degrees of freedom. And the other is if you have more generalized coordinates than degrees of freedom. So we'll start with start with this minimal set of generalized coordinates so let's just we'll just assume this for now assume for now we'll relax that but it leads to other things called lagrange multipliers but for now we'll assume a set of generalized minimal set of generalized coordinates means n equals the number of degrees of freedom. And in that case, that means that all the qj's or qi's, all the qi's can vary independently. There's no constraint equation that relates them. And so then that that's equivalent to I'll put the arrows going both ways because all of these things are equivalent. Having a minimal set, n equals the degrees of freedom, that's equivalent to all the QIs can vary, which means that all these admissible virtual displacements can vary independently. And so that simplifies things for us dependently. Because if we were to write out, let's take this big equation up there, what's it going to look like? It looks like a bunch of things in square brackets times, you know, Q delta Q1 plus something in square brackets times delta Q2 all the way to something in square brackets times delta QN equals zero. And if all of these delta Qs can vary independently, that means that each of the things in the square brackets must independently be zero. So each of the n square bracket terms must be zero.
All right. So that simplifies our life. Um, because what does it mean? Let's write out what each of these square things is. It means each of the square things looks like this. It's a sum over the particles. Applied force in particle J minus mass particle J inertial acceleration of particle J dotted with this projection vector J I equals zero. And there are I goes from one to little n. So there's a free index here and it's little i. Okay. So that is, this is D'Alembert's principle when you've got a minimal set of generalized coordinates. So maybe we, you know, maybe we'll give this a name like MD minimal D'Alembert. Okay. Um, I guess there is something you might be tempted to do. You might be tempted to say, why not just kind of write this as F equals MA? So can I write F equals M? It's like you're writing Newton's law, but just with the applied forces, not with the constraint forces. No, you can't. The, taking those projections into certain directions, the directions in which there are no constraints is important. So no, you can't, you can't do this. Sorry. But what you do end up getting from this is, um, so these are, these are N equations, little n. In fact, they're N second order ordinary differential equations for the Q's. So that means, what does that mean? It means you will have something like QI double dot equals something all the way down to QN double dot. <clears throat> so it says how the Q's evolve according or due to the applied forces. So do you see how we've kind of abstracted away from how particles move to now this set of generalized coordinates that describe how the whole system of particles moves. And that is um, one of the kind of mental leaps that comes in when you do Lagrangian mechanics or analytical dynamics. So this describes how the cues evolve uh, according to the, the active or if you want applied forces. So let's do an example. We'll do an example um, that's got two particles, but there's only one uh, generalized coordinate because we only have one degree of freedom. Are there, are there questions at this point before we do the example? No. Yeah, this is one of those things where it's, it's helpful to go through examples. And thus, homeworks. So here's the, uh, I'll help you out. This gets you started on the last homework problem. This is the baton sliding off the wall. Okay. Let's insert something here. Where's my baton? There it is. So we've got this situation. It's a, uh, we got two masses. Right, They're, it's leaning against a corner. Particle one is on the ground, particle two is on, on the wall and they are um, held together by a rigid rod of length L. So we've got lots of constraints here. The first one would be they're both constrained to be in a plane. Uh, particle two is constrained to be along the wall. Particle one is constrained to be along the floor. There's also the rigid rigidity constraint that keeps these two a constant distance L away from each other. So if you 
if you imagine what this situation is like, it's a lot like the, um, it's a broom leaning against a wall, right? It, it's a broom leaning against a wall. And so the, what could we use uh, as a generalized coordinate to describe this? Well, we could use like the, the height of this contact point along the wall. We could also use the angle. Um, we'll use the angle. So it's a lot like the broom. <clears throat> so this has, it, well, independent of the coordinate we choose, this has one degree of freedom, right? We said the degrees of freedom are something independent of which coordinates you use. So this has one degree of freedom, um, at least while it's in contact with both the floor and the wall, right? If the, if the top mass pulls away from the wall, then this jumps up in degrees of freedom. But while uh, there's, it's in contact with the floor and the wall, it's one degree of freedom. Okay, and so that means um, because all of the constraints here are kind of constraints on configuration variables, not constraints on velocities, we can theoretically find that n equals one uh, that special generalized coordinate that uh, describes our system. And so we have, we, we actually have lots of choices. You, we could choose X of this thing against the, uh, the floor. We could use Y of this thing up here. I'm going to use the angle the angle that this thing makes theta with the uh, vertical direction. So I choose theta as the generalized coordinate. And then I'll write the, um, I need to write the position of both particles in terms of this one generalized coordinate. So, right, I wasn't told uh, what origin to use, but I'll use the corner. It seems like a nice enough origin. I'll call this direction, this inertial direction N1. I'll call this direction N2. Um, so the location of particle one, and then the location of particle two, I'll write that in terms of theta. And I can do that. So R1 is, I just gotta do some trig. This is L sine theta in the n1 direction, okay? And then over here, let me write what r2 is. It's uh, L cosine theta, in the, sorry, n2, this one was n1, let's say n1. Now let's take the inertial derivative. So this is v1, velocity of particle one. L cosine theta, theta dot, still in the N1 direction. And V2, we get a negative, negative L sine theta, theta dot, N2 direction. Um, it's convenient at this point to get those projection vectors. Remember those projection vectors? We've got, so for this, we've chosen, we've got one Q and it's theta. And so Q1 dot is theta dot. So my projection vector, the first index is the uh, particle. So Q1, one is going to be, this would be partial uh, R1 partial theta. This is also the same as partial V1, partial theta dot. And for both of those, what do I get? L cosine theta N1. I think it's easier to do the velocity one because I could see, all right, V1, um, it's linear in theta dot. So taking that derivative is, is easier. 
you know, like this is weird. I'm taking derivative of a vector with respect to a scalar. Yeah, it's a little bit weird. Um, okay, gamma is particle two, one. So uh, this is particle, this is partial R2, partial theta, but I think it's easier to do partial V2, partial theta dot, and I get negative L sine theta N2. So those projection vectors will come in when I write out the full D'Alembert principle. Um, what else are we going to need? We're going to need the inertial derivatives of the velocities. In other words, the acceleration. So let's write the accelerations. I need a couple of lines for that. So here's the inertial derivative of V1. This will be L cosine theta, theta double dot minus L sine theta, theta dot squared, all in the N1 direction. Take the inertial derivative of V2 and I'll get something else, L negative L sine theta, theta double dot minus L cosine theta, theta dot squared in the N2 direction. All right, all right. And we'll just to make life easier, um, we'll just assume equal masses for now. So M1 and M2, the upper mass and the lower mass are both equal to just mass M. <clears throat> all right, what's left? Well, we have um, forces, maybe I'll use this color. I like using that color. Let's use, uh, let's write the applied forces, right? Because we, the beauty of the D'Alembert principle and Lagrange's equations is you can ignore forces of constraint. So we don't have to worry about tension or reaction forces for now. So that's awesome. We have uh, an applied force on particle one, which is just gravity. So this is negative MGN2. And same thing over here. This is the applied, oops, applied force on particle two, negative mg n2. I think we have everything that is necessary. So now we write D'Alembert's principle. Maybe let's sneak up there and remind ourselves what it is. Okay, so we've got a sum from uh, over two particles of this stuff. All right, uh, D'Alembert. Excuse me, Professor? Yeah. How come we don't have to include friction forces? I'm assuming this is uh, frictionless. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Baton sliding up the wall without friction. So if uh, you need to deal with friction, then you'll have to write the friction force. Gotcha. Yeah, this is just the simplest case just to get us started. So the D'Alembert principle here, let me just write out the sum. So for particle one, this is, this is all one scalar equation, strangely. So gamma one, one plus, Applied force on particle two minus M times the acceleration dotted with gamma two one equals zero. Why is there just one equation? There's one equation because we only have one generalized coordinate, it's Q1, which is theta. So now we just start plugging in everything for here. And uh, this might take up a couple of lines. Let me just start writing it out. Minus M G N two minus M, and this is particle one M. So we get L cosine theta, theta double dot minus L sine theta, theta dot squared N one dotted with, what is gamma one one? Gamma one one is L 
cosine theta n one. Okay, that's and then plus. So that was just for particle one. This is the thing for particle two. And it's the same force, force due to gravity, minus m minus l sine theta, theta double dot, minus l cosine theta, theta dot squared. And this is in the n2 direction, dotted with what now? Minus l sine theta n2 equals zero. OK. You collect all the terms. So uh, the mass M is everywhere. So I'm just going to you know, cancel it out. And there's a bunch of L's and whatnot. I guess we'll keep those. Uh, what will we be left with? Uh, this becomes L squared. And I'm just gonna write, yeah, I'll do it. I'll write the full thing, cosine squared. L cosine squared theta, theta double dot, minus L squared sine theta cosine theta, theta dot squared. I'm just carrying through the dot product, all right? Um, this N1 dotted with N2 gives me zero, so I can ignore that part. So I'm just doing N1 dotted with N1, just one, okay. So that's it for particle one. Then what? L squared, sine squared, sine theta. This is, remember, N2, N2, um, theta double dot plus L squared, sine theta, cosine theta, theta dot squared. Mm, then what? Uh, Mine plus minus dotted with um L minus L sine theta G. So we've divided by minus n, so we're left with this. this, is what we get. Notice this term cancels with this term. And this is a cosine, oops, that's a cosine uh, theta squared and a sine theta squared. It adds up to give us one. So we have L squared theta double dot equals L g sine theta which gives us theta double dot equals g over l sine theta looks kind of like the pendulum the pendulum has a minus sign here so it's really important there is not a minus sign here which means what as this thing falls it's actually going to be accelerating so if we were to simulate that, it would be accelerating. In fact, I'll show you what it looks like if we were to simulate this, if I, if I know what I'm doing. I mean, you could do this at home. Take it, get on a frictionless surface if you can manage and make this happen. Uh, where is it? I think it's here. Yeah, this is kind of cool. And here I, I start this out at an angle of five degrees. I'm even showing you the reaction force of the wall. So if I let go, well, it accelerates. And actually this shows that something interesting happens. The, the normal force reaches a peak and then goes back down. It goes to zero, at which point the upper mass actually pulls away from the wall. So if you're able to do this experiment in a low or zero friction setting, what you would find is you release your broom leaning against the wall. And as the broom falls, the handle will pull away from the wall. You might try it. And if you do, you know, film it or something. When you have some friction, it does change things. For low enough friction, it will still pull away from the wall. For large enough friction, 
it won't be able to pull away from the wall before it hits the ground first. So it, for all that work, this is just shockingly simple. Um, I guess it has to do with trig identities and stuff. And you might even say, why did I choose theta? Why didn't I choose X? Okay, if I use the equation for X of the lower mass against the wall, it'd be this horrendous looking equation. So I knew ahead of time the using the angle theta would be the simplest looking equation. And it is, it's, it's very nice. So there we go. So yeah, with friction, you'll have to know things like what is the normal reaction force so that you could calculate the, the Coulomb friction for both of these. Good luck with that. Um, all right, I'll show you an example where I'm gonna use Mathematica because it's kind of set up that um, you can turn a crank at some point and everything just sort of works out. So may as well do that. So let's do now a two particle system with two degrees of freedom. This is the cart pendulum system. So another example, I guess it's a pendulum in a cart. Um, let's get a figure for it. Uh, this, this one. So this has some like built-in constraints. Particle one moves only horizontally. Particle two is connected rigidly to particle one. And so we've got, uh, got a two particle system, capital N equals two particles. And then uh, we've got two degrees of freedom. Like, well, what are they? I mean, I can see the cart sliding back and forth seems to me one degree of freedom. And then the angle made by the pendulum would be another degree of freedom. Uh, we don't actually have to use those two, but I will. So we've got a case of, uh, we could pick the number of generalized coordinates equals two. So we have a minimal, I mean, a minimal set of generalized coordinates. We've done this problem before, so we kind of have a good idea of what we would use we would use, uh, let me draw an inertial frame here. We would use the location of particle, let's call this, this is R1. We would use X, right? So R1 equals X in the N1 direction. And then uh, for particle two, we would use the angle and to actually get at where particle two is from the origin. Well, I don't know what happened there. Particle two is, well, location of particle one, then plus things related to uh, sines and cosines. Use L sine theta minus L cosine theta. Let's write it that way, right? We could write particle one as X zero in the inertial frame. It's on the inertial frame. This thing with the ends over here is the inertial frame. So we could use as our Qs, Q1 equals X, Q2 equals theta. So we've got those are our two generalized coordinates. And um, then what else would we need? We just need to write the applied forces. So don't have to worry about any forces of constraint. Um, to make this interesting, let's say I'm pulling on the cart with some kind of force in the X direction. 
It's a force that could vary with time. So I'll say that my applied force on particle one is, uh, and there's also gravity. So in the X direction, I've got F as a function of time. And then in the N2 direction, it's minus capital M G. So the cart has a mass capital M. What about for uh, particle two? What's the applied force? It's just gravity. I guess maybe put a subscript I, so I know this is all in the inertial frame. So now I can just turn a crank, right? I'm just plugging these things in, taking dot products and stuff. So this could either be U or something else like Mathematica. So you could literally do something like this for the homework problem with the, uh, the double pendulum. If I, I'm gonna go to my, and I'll, I'll provide this example code for you. Let me go to my code for Mathematica. Um, I don't think I can click that one. I can click the, uh, this is a PDF of the code. So I first define particle one, uh, R, R1, the vector R1, and then R2, and I'm using the syntax for um, Mathematica. I'm taking a first derivative with respect to time, a second derivative with respect to time, defining my applied forces, FA1 and F21, and then all of these gammas. And then um, I could write what is the first equation from the D'Alembert's principle. So this is, this is the equation for Q1, which is equal to X. And you'll notice that Q1 double dot and Q2 double dot are there. This is the second D'Alembert equation, which comes from theta, but you'll notice again, Q2 double dot and Q1 double dot are there. I put in some numbers and stuff. Um, so I'll, Looks like I'm planning to simulate that. If I now just from Mathematica, what did Mathematica give me? It gave me uh, from D'Alembert's principle. If you collect the terms, you get something that looks like this. And that's sort of, that's from the first D'Alembert equation. And then the second one looks like this. Uh, I think this is actually an X double dot and that's a theta. So this is what I get. So I've got some second order ODEs. Unfortunately, they're all mixed up, um, but I can write this in a matrix form and then you'll see some structure to this equation. All right, Mathematica is not gonna tell you to write it in matrix form. So this is something you have to know. Um, so we'll write in a standard matrix form and I'll use this notate Q, I'll write it as Q bar, Q underscore equals X theta. So that means that Q double dot, I take two derivatives and this is X double dot and theta double dot. Okay, if I write in a matrix form like that, then this, set of scalar ODEs becomes a matrix equation, which has some nice structure. Got M plus M, 
ML cosine theta over here, ML cosine theta. Oh, that's interesting. Looks like we have a symmetric matrix times X double dot theta double dot plus basically everything else, ML theta dot squared sine theta minus F, which could vary in time. Down here, this is MGL cosine theta. And then this equals zero in both of their categories. Okay, I will, this matrix I recognize as, oh, this is Q double dot. This, I will give the name, the mass matrix. So since it's a, uh, square matrix, I'll put two underscores. This is, uh, we'll call this matrix the F matrix. And notice it's a function of Q and Q dot and possibly time through that time dependent uh, force. And then this is just the zero vector over here. Uh, and notice M could be a function of Q. So maybe we could remind ourselves of that. So if we collect all these in matrix form, this is what we have. And it's worth noting D'Alembert's principle always puts the second order ODEs for the Qs in this form. And that's important. Um, we call this thing M, the mass matrix. Even though it depends on things other than mass. Right, it can depend on uh, the state of the cues. Um, it's always symmetric. Which means, um, and this is kind of a check, if you're if you find that M transpose does not equal M, then you've done something wrong. So it should be symmetric. It's symmetric and it's invertible. Which means that the uh, inverse exists. And another way to check that the inverse exists is that the determinant of M does not equal zero. So if we actually take the determinant of this M, what do we get? We'll get M times M L squared plus M L M squared L squared sine squared theta. This term is always uh, depending on theta, but this is greater than or equal to zero. This is always greater than zero. So that means together, the determinant is always greater than zero. If the determinant of a matrix is not equal to zero, then the inverse exists. And why do we care about that? Uh, because we would love to get this in the form of Q double dot equals something, which we can do. We just multiply this equation, move the F to the other side, multiply by M inverse. So because M inverse exists, Q double dot equals negative M inverse times F. So this is in a standard form that you could simulate with appropriate software. Uh, so if you're if you were more interested in using MATLAB, well, this is an, an appropriate form. And it was given to you automatically. That's kind of the 
interesting thing computationally about the D'Alembert principle and later Lagrange's equations is they automatically give you things in a form that's uh, good for simulating. So for example, MATLAB. Okay, so what would this mean? This means you've got X double dot equals something, theta double dot equals something. Then you could put this into first order form. So hopefully you know how to take second order ODEs, put them into first order form. Um, and you would take in an initial conditions. So like the initial X, initial X dot, time, let's say zero, X dot, theta at time zero, theta dot at time zero, and then you would simulate. And you could simulate for whatever you want to get this x at time t, x dot at time t, theta at time t, theta dot at time t. Okay. So I, I did that and I'll provide that code for you for uh, Mathematica. So I simulated this, I gave some dimensions. Here's L, here's M, here's G. Uh, I even gave some function of F, that's the thing pulling on the cart. I said 2.4 times sine 3T. I don't know, just something interesting to see what we get. And then um, this solves for, this is the angle, I think. So we've got the angle versus time starting from some initial condition. And then this is showing the path that the, uh, the pendulum bob makes. In yellow, that the yellow is really hard to see, but that's just showing what the cart does. And the cart's just moving on a straight line. So you don't see anything interesting there. Um, everything started over here. So this was the initial condition for the pendulum bob, right? The small mass. And this is what it does over that T max time period. 20 seconds or something. And you see it does interesting things. The tendency is to go this way because that's the force that the cart's being pulled, okay? So I will provide that code to you and you can modify it to do other things. All right. There's something else worth noting here. Uh, this mass matrix, you're like, huh, I didn't expect a mass matrix. Does this mass matrix mean anything? Yeah, yeah, it does. The mass matrix is related to kinetic energy. So if we were to write the kinetic energy of our system, we could write it in matrix form this way. We'd write Q dot transpose times the mass matrix times Q dot. So that's um, suggestive. It suggests that maybe there's some way to get at this mass matrix or to get our equations of motion more quickly using just the kinetic energy expression, which there, there is. So that's what we'll say a little bit about now. All right. Um, just, I'm gonna write down again, the, what the equation look like for D'Alembert's principle. Got the applied force minus mj inertial derivative of the velocity of particle j dotted with gamma ji. And there's an index here, one to n. This is for the 
the minimal set of generalized coordinates case. And we're gonna start defining things. We'll just carry this dot product through. If we carry the dot product through, that J one through N, F J A dotted with Q J I as a vector, and then uh, minus um, M, I guess the sum here, J goes from one to the number of particles, M J, initial derivative of V J dotted with gamma J I. So we're just carrying through the dot product with these projection vectors. And we'll say, ah, oh, what's this? So we're, we're gonna define something we call, uh, we'll define Q I, and it's just this thing, this sum of the dot product of the forces on particle J with these projection vectors. And we will call this the, the generalized force. If you want, it's the generalized force in the little qi direction. It's not really clear what directions these correspond to in, like, in space. But this is the, the generalized force. So there's little n of these generalized forces, uh, but then, which then leaves us with, you know, what is this? Um, well, let's go back to, I've written the kinetic energy up here. The kinetic energy, kinetic uh, energy. Right, capital T, it's the sum of all of the particles. So J goes from one to big N, one half mass velocity squared. So one half MJ, VJ dotted with VJ, okay? If we write everything in terms of generalized coordinates and the generalized velocities, then this is going to be some function of the, the Qs and the Q dots. All right. And you can, uh, I'm gonna say some weasel words here. It turns out, but you can, you can look this up if you want. You can see pages uh, 591 to 593 in Kasdan and uh, Paley or um, page 76 of Greenwood. It turns out that, so look at this sum up here, this sum, J goes from one to N, MJ is inertial derivative dotted with gamma J I. That equals, some weird combination of derivatives of the kinetic energy. But if you go through that, you could see it, but it turns out this is equal to the total derivative of partial T, partial Q I dot minus partial T, partial Q I. That's kind of interesting. So that means that this equation up here, we can rewrite it. So the Ith D'Alembert equation can be, and I'll, I'll just write it this way. I guess this is the way, uh, this comes from D'Alembert's principle We'll write it that way, okay? 
and there are uh, the index i goes from one to n. So this this inertial term in purple up here, we called this. It was related to an inertial force. It it's basically what uh, we're taking a dot product of mass times acceleration, and that term ends up uh, becoming this this term. It's related to derivatives of kinetic energy. And that equals a generalized force, right? This thing up here. So it's it's kind of a, uh, it's another way of writing F equals MA, but in terms of kinetic energy and taking certain projections. Now written this way, it does, it comes from D'Alembert's principle, but this is, you might call this a, uh, We'll call it Lagrange's equation. So this is Lagrange's equations in a generalized force form. Where we've defined this thing that we call the generalized force, capital QI, all right? And it's only a projection of the active forces. Um, Lagrange's equations are sometimes called uh, Euler-Lagrange equations, but anyway. So these are the inertial terms. You know, you know for example, acceleration. And then over here, these are the active forces. Okay, so it's it's a nice way to write things. Um, let's get some practice. Let's do some examples. Okay, so first we'll do a let's do a spring mass system because we think we know what the answer will be. So let's let's try it. Example, no, it's example. Example, uh, spring mass. This is just one degree of freedom. If we want a little sketch over here. We've got a mass connected by a spring. And here's the equilibrium location. So we'll just sort of track the displacement we'll call that displacement x. This thing has an inertial velocity, vi, that's x dot in the, there's only one direction that matters. Let's call that the n1 direction, the inertial n1 direction. And there's only one active force, that's the force due to the spring. So f a of particle one, it's negative k, the spring constant, times the stretch in the spring, also in the n1 direction. So to follow this way of writing D'Alembert's principle, which we're, we're calling Lagrange's equation, we need to write the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy, we just have one particle, so it's one half, the mass of our particle, it's inertial velocity squared, one half m x out squared. And notice this is of the form, generally it's of a form function of x and x dot. It turns out it doesn't depend on x, it only depends on x dot. And that's a key thing. Um, we got to write our projection vector, gamma one one, so that we could get q one or qx. So partial v one partial x dot is uh, just n one, you're like, what does this come from, right? This gamma one one is partial V one, partial Q one dot, but Q one dot is X dot, okay. So Q one, we could also write this Q X, 
this is it's the applied for this is just from the definition up here of what the generalized force is and we only have one particle so it's a dot product of our one particle with our one projection vector that's so this dotted with gamma one one so negative k x n one dotted with n one equals what do you know negative k x okay so we've got all the ingredients we need. Now we need to take these derivatives on this left-hand side of Lagrange's equations up here. So what is, I mean, partial t partial x is zero. So that's easy. Partial t partial x dot. Yeah, so for purposes of taking these partial derivatives, a coordinate and its time rate of change are independent. Okay, this can sometimes be confusing. So partial t, partial x dot. So we're doing partial, partial x dot of one half m x dot squared. So this is just m x dot. Okay, now take the total derivative of that. Mass doesn't depend on time. So we're taking the total derivative of m x dot, which is m x double dot. Now plug into what we've got up there, d by dt, partial t, partial x dot, minus partial t, partial x equals, let's call this qx. Plug everything in, mx double dot minus zero equals minus kx. Okay, so this gives us mx double dot equals negative kx, which is, we know from just applying Newton's second law that this is what we would get. So this, good, but that's a verification. Same answer as other familiar methods. We wanna do something simple before we do something complicated because uh, that's the way to go. All right, we still have some time. So if we could do, let's do the two, the, the baton system again, okay. Um, let me insert the, the baton. The falling dumbbell or baton. Let's try this. Let's try the new method on this. By new method, I mean Lagrange's equations. So from what we've already written, we could write down the kinetic energy. We have, it's one half M uh, velocity of particle two squared plus one half m, uh, sorry, velocity of particle one and velocity of particle two. And we could just plug in what those things are. We'll get one half m, we already wrote it, theta dot squared, uh, uh, there's a cosine squared, I think there's an L squared. Cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. Which, if, if you did this in Mathematica, it would probably leave it in there and think, oh, wow, I have all this dependence on theta. Whereas hopefully you recognize this as a fancy way of writing one because of the trig identity. So we just have T equals one half M L squared theta dot squared. All right, and then Q theta is going to be the applied force of particle one dotted with gamma one one, which we already worked out what gamma one one is, plus applied force on particle two dotted with gamma two one. Remember the applied force is just gravity, in both of these cases. Uh, gamma 
one one is in the n2 direction and so this ends up being zero because the applied force is in the n2 direction this is n1 this is n2 what does this give us this part gives us negative mg n2 dotted with minus l uh, sine theta n2. So this gives us, there's a minus times a minus. So this is m g l sine theta. Okay, that's q theta, that's cool. Now take the um, take derivatives of this kinetic energy. Notice partial t, partial theta is zero. Partial t, partial theta dot is m l squared theta dot. So the total derivative of that is m l squared theta double dot. So now we have all we need to apply Lagrange's equations. After a while, you will memorize how to write this. We just had one degree of freedom, so there we go. Uh, plug in everything, ML squared theta double dot equals MGL sine theta. What does this give us? We want to write theta double dot equals something. So this becomes theta double dot equals G over L sine theta. Cool. Same as the earlier method, but I would say it's more direct. All right, well, we'll end on the most challenging one, I suppose, which is, We'll just redo the cart pendulum system, but use this energy point of view. So where's our handy dandy cart pendulum system? Uh, here. And we already have most of the pieces needed to, to work this out. Remember? So, so do, do the same setup as above for card pendulum. But using the uh, Lagrange's equation form. So we had V1 equals X dot in the N1 direction. Uh, V2 equals, it ends up being X dot plus L theta dot cosine theta in the N1 direction plus L theta dot sine theta in the N2 direction. Kinetic energy is one half capital M, V1 squared, plus one half little m, V2 squared. What does this give us? One half capital M, x dot squared, plus one half m, x dot squared, plus, uh, just carrying it all out, L squared, theta dot squared, plus 2L x dot theta dot cosine theta. That's the kinetic energy that's gonna go into Lagrange's equation. And remember, this is a, we've got N equals two. So Q1 is X, Q2 is theta. So we'll have two Lagrange's equations. Notice that this kinetic energy is of the form in general, it's a function of X and theta and x dot and theta dot. And it, it really is a function of theta through there. It's not a function of x dot. 
Um, so we might even note partial t partial x is zero, but partial t partial theta is not zero. So you can't forget that term. What were the applied forces? Uh, we had the, this thing was being pulled. There's gravity pulling on this. It's gravity pulling on this. So if we were to write the applied forces, this is F T N one minus M G N two. I'm just rewriting something we had before minus little M G N two. Then we could write the generalized forces. There's two generalized forces now, right? For Q1 equals X, we have capital Q1. Capital Q1 is, we've got two particles now. So sum from J equals one to two of F A J dotted with gamma, that's a gamma gamma j one. So this, this index matches this index. And what did we have for the gammas? Gamma one, one was partial V one, partial Q one dot, it's just N one gamma two, one, partial V, two, partial Q, one, dot. That's also just N, one. So Q, one, uh, the only thing that survives, right? This gravity is in the N, two direction, but the force that's pulling is in the N, two, N, one. So this equals F, And then uh, similarly, what you get for Q2, well, maybe I'll do it over here, got room. Q2, sum J goes from one to two, F J A dotted with gamma J2, right? This index two matches this index based on what we wrote up above for, um, I'm not gonna repeat it, uh, but if you work that out, this will give you uh, minus MGL sine theta. Okay, cool. Um, we got partial T partial X dot. Well, we have M, X, capital M, X dot, plus, got to be careful here, little m, X dot, plus, we've got dependence on X dot over here. So we've got, uh, what will that give us? M, L, theta dot, cosine theta. And now, and this is maybe the trickiest, take the total derivative of that partial t, partial x dot. There's lots of things that depend on time. x dot obviously depends on time. Theta dot will depend on time. And then you need to take the derivative of cosine theta. So taking this total derivative, you got to be careful. So you'll get m x double dot plus little m x double dot plus, and I'll just group these two together, ML. Now take the total derivative of that, you'll get theta double dot cosine theta plus theta dot squared times negative sine theta. That part can mess with people, okay? So the first Lagrange equation That means, you know, index I equals one. D by DT, right, we're looking at Q1 equals X. Uh, partial T, partial X dot minus partial T, partial X, which remember that's zero, equals Q1. 
that will end up giving us what? Um, let's group terms, capital M plus little m times x double dot plus ML theta double dot cosine theta minus theta dot squared sine theta equals, and what was Q1? Q1 was just equal to F T. Which if you check with what we had ab above, this is the same. Same as above using the D'Alembert principle. And I'll say, I mean, you can check maybe as an exercise. Similarly, you get the same equation for uh, I equals two. Remember Q2 equals theta. So if you take this total derivative of partial T, partial theta dot, minus partial t, partial theta, that will equal q2. It'll be the same, and you can double check that. So that's, um, that's it for today.